This is FRM Part 1, Book 2, Foundations of Risk Management, Chapter 9, Hypothesis Tests and Confidence Intervals in Multiple Regression. Now, the good news for you guys is this. This chapter could have been called, You Already Know This Stuff. And it's very clear, and you'll see this when we look at the learning objectives here in just a second, that there are a lot of familiar topics. But what we need to do in this chapter is take the material to which we've had exposure and then apply it in the multiple regression format. Let me show you what I mean here. So what are we doing? Construct, apply, and interpret hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. We've done that before. A joint hypothesis and confidence intervals for multiple coefficients. We haven't done that, but we've done some type of hypothesis testing. So we're just going to kind of extend it here. F statistic, uh, that has a little bit different meaning in multiple regression than what we talked about before. Multiple coefficients, confidence intervals, omitted variables, and then R squared and adjusted R squared. So these should be familiar topics. Let's see how they apply in the multiple regression framework. Quick recap here. Uh, a simple linear regression model looks like this, in which we have an X variable, which is the uh, independent explanatory variable that is trying to explain that dependent variable, that y variable. And there's the formula there uh, up on the top right. And so that should be uh, pretty straightforward. What all we're saying is that x is going to do a good job in explaining y, and we're going to have some good fundamental reasons for doing so. Let me just remind you of a quick example that I gave you in a previous chapter. Let's suppose that we're trying to determine the performance on my son's German test, and we collect data on their performance, so that's the y variable, and then we collect data on the number of hours that they studied for that exam. So that simple linear regression model then kind of summarizes the relationship between those two variables. We use the method of the ordinary least squares to estimate uh, beta 0 and beta 1. Remember, we put hats on those things. And there's that error term, which just simply tells us that we're not perfect. Now, what we're going to do when we assume a simple linear regression is we put all we put all the pressure on that one independent variable to explain the dependent variable. But there's no reason that dependent variables aren't functions of other variables as well. So that's why we're extending this to the multiple regression framework. What this does is it simultaneously considers the influence of multiple explanatory variables. So back in our, my example about my children, let's just suppose we're still measuring the performance on their German test, and our x1 variable is still going to be the number of hours studied for that German test. But then a second variable might be number of hours that they played on their video games. And a third variable might be the number of hours they spent practicing basketball or tennis. And a fourth variable might be something else, and a fifth and a sixth. And what you try to do is you try to come up with multiple variables that are relevant and fundamentally and economically sound in their ability to predict the performance on a German test. You know, like, for example, I could collect data on how many slushies that they consume a week. And that, uh, that's probably not too relevant to their performance on the exam, unless, of course, <laughs> they have a slushy right before they go in and take the exam, and all that sugar throws off their brains. All right, let's test for significance of a single coefficient. And this is identical to what we did back in the simple linear regression model, but we have to kind of take a step back and see that it has a little bit different implications. So there's the formula there. The test statistic is equal to the estimated regression coefficient. There's the beta hat. And now in this case, there has to be a sub j because remember, let me just swing back here. Remember, there's a 1 and there's a 2 and there's a 3 all the way out to however many there are. Then we're going to subtract um, the value of the estimate under the null hypothesis, which is almost going to be equal to 0, but it doesn't have to be. Like, for example, if you were doing a test of some stock returns on individual stocks versus market returns like, like the S&P 500, 
um, you might want to test that the slope coefficient is different from one. We want to know if it has the same systematic risk as the market portfolio. All right, so, but most of the time it's going to be zero, but it doesn't have to be. And then we'll divide, like we've been talking about for many, many chapters, we divide by some me measure of variability or volatility. In this case, we use the standard error. And then we've got to worry about degrees of freedom. We always have to worry about degrees of freedom. So this is going to be n minus k. k is the number of independent variables. And then remember, for our simple linear regression model, we had n minus 2 because there was k was just one variable, right? All right, let's take a look at an example. We, we did this example back in the previous chapter. Our dependent variable is the change in gross domestic product. We collect 30 observations and we go out and we get some interest rates and we get some inflation. And we use the method of the ordinary least squares and there's the regression output. So there are the coefficients in the middle column. There are the standard errors in the far right column. And so let's ask the question, is the coefficient for interest rates significantly different from zero at the 5% level? Now look, let's take a step back here. I mean, clearly even a kindergarten could look at this matrix and say, well, yes, 0.2 is not the same as zero. So therefore, interest rates are not significant. But that might be mathematically true. Of course, 0.2 is not zero. But we need to know if there's some statistical significance about this, which is different than just kind of a, a math kind of a difference. And we need to use that standard error there on the far right column. All right, so there's our regression equation in my first circle point. We've got 0.10. There's the intercept term plus 0.2 times interest rates plus 0.15 times inflation. Note, note that both coefficients are positive. And so in these 30 observations, that tells us that when interest rates go up and when inflation goes up, then uh, gross domestic product growth will be positive. Uh, there is the null hypothesis. We want to test that beta hat one is equal to zero versus the alternative that it's not equal to zero. And remember, when you do the equal sign and you put a slash through it, in the null hypothesis, you're automatically assuming a two-tailed test. So there's the test statistic. Let me just go back just quickly. Uh, there's the formula. Um, so we're taking the 0.2 minus our hypothesized value. There, that's 0. And divided by the standard error, so that gets us 4. And I know that most of you have been paying good attention here. If you have a test statistic that's four, I mean, that's probably significant no matter how many degrees of freedom there are. But let's just make sure we look at the table and get the, and get the critical value uh, accurately determined. So we've got 30 observations, right? We have two variables, so that gets us down to 28. And then we got that extra last degree of freedom to get us down to 27 degrees of freedom. So run your finger down the left-hand column of the T-table and then run your finger over to half of 5%, right? Because it's a two-tailed test and you get uh, somewhere around two, 2.05. So our test statistic is greater than the critical value. So we say that the interest rate coefficient is statistically significant at the 5% level. Now, very quickly, before I move on to the next slide, we can just skip down and do the same thing for inflation. We could, we could repeat this and do all that stuff there and uh, underneath the matrix. And let's just quickly do it. What's 15 divided by 3? Even I can do that without my calculator. That's 5. So, of course, the inflation coefficient is also going to be significant at the 5% level. But remember, these hypothesis tests are for single coefficients. You can't use the t-test to uh, answer the question, are all, are all of the slope coefficients statistically significant? I'll come back to that in a few slides. Let's move on to a confidence interval then. So let's, let's do the same thing that we did before, but instead of, instead of using the mean as our point estimate for a confidence interval, we're going to use the estimated slope coefficient, the estimated regression coefficient. Remember the example that I gave you back in uh, a previous chapter? 
uh, whenever my son, this is my older son, plays in a golf tournament, I always say, hey, what, what do you think you're going to shoot today? And he'll say, oh, I don't know, 72, 73, 74, somewhere around there. And I'll say, all right, well, give me a 95% confidence interval. And he'll say, oh, I'm 95% sure that I'm going to shoot between a 69 and a 78 or something like that. And so what he's doing is he's calculating the mean and he's calculating the variability in his golf swing and he's thinking about the golf course. And so he's trying to give me a range, right? So that's really what a confidence interval is. But now, as it applies to regression analysis, we're going to take that estimated regression coefficient. And instead of my son kind of pr processing all the stuff in his brain, we're going to use the method of the ordinary least squares, which does some minimization. What we're going to do is try to minimize some variability. So that that's our point, co, uh, our point estimate. So that estimated regression coefficient, then we plus or minus, then we add or subtract the critical value, which we just looked at on the previous slide, times that standard error. So that should be pretty straightforward, really based on what we talked about in a previous, in a previous chapter. All right, let's swing back to this joint hypothesis test. So look at the first uh, square point that I have there. We cannot test the null hypothesis that all slope coefficients are equal to zero based on t-tests that look at each individual slope coefficient. So really, really what you're tempted to do is kind of throw all these slope coefficients and t-tests into a bucket and say, oh, oh, let's just throw them in there and, and see what happens. But, but you can't because remember that those individual tests ignore the interactions among the independent variables. Remember, we, we assume that they're independent, that they don't have any relationship with each other, but that, that's, not, that's not true. Let's go back to this example. Clearly, uh, inflation is a component of interest rates, depending on what kind of an interest rate you make. So they're gonna have, they're gonna have some kind of a relationship. So to solve this problem, we, we use an F-test. And so there's the null hypothesis in the box at the bottom for an F-test. And notice what's happening here. The null is that beta 1 hat equals beta 2 hat equals beta 10 hat equals beta 100 hat, if you have 100 variables, which is kind of a crazy thing anyway. But then notice that you go all the way out to K and that they, equals, that, that they are hypothesized to equal 0. All right, so this is kind of a global test, and we have to use the F test. And then the null is that not all of them are equal to zero, but, but at least one of the beta coefficients is equal to zero. And there's the formula for the F statistic. And so it looks uh, um, not anything like the test statistic for the individual slope coefficients, but there are some similarities. I mean, what we're doing is in the numerator, we have the explained sum of squares divided by the sum of the squared residuals, which is kind of similar to the t-test, but, but not really. And then we've got to divide by degrees of freedom. So with an f-test, you have uh, two degrees of freedom. You have degrees of freedom in the numerator, which is always the number of independent variables, and then you have uh, the degrees of freedom for the denominator, which is the same as what we had before, and minus k minus 1. All right, so the decision rule is exactly like all of our other tests. We're going to reject the null hypothesis if the test statistic, if the, here, let me go back here real quick, if the calculated f test statistic is greater than what you observe on the critical value table, then we're going to reject the um, reject the null hypothesis. And so all we can say is that at least one of the independent variables makes a significant contribution to the dependent variable. All right, let's take a look at an example. Um, We've got 48 months monthly returns for four independent variables. Let's not worry about what those are. So there's some regression output. The total sum of squares, 360. Sum of the squared errors is 120. There's a 5% level of significance. Let's test the null hypothesis that beta 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 are all equal to 0 versus the null hypothesis that one of them is not equal to zero. So there's our quick formulations there, and we can 
put that all together in the numerator and the denominator. Just make sure you're careful about degrees of freedom here. And so you get around 21. And if you uh, look that number up on the F table, run your finger down over to four, then run your finger over to 43. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And we can conclude that at least one of those four independent variables is significantly different from zero. So do you see how the F test kind of complements the T test? You run this regression, you estimate a set of linear parameters, and then you look at each individual slope coefficient and you see if each one of these things is statistically different from zero. And then you go and do this kind of a global test. Now, R square, of course, is exactly what it was back in our simple linear regression. It's the coefficient of determination. It measures the goodness of fit. And what it does is it measures the degree to which the variability on the right hand side of the regression model explains the variability of the dependent variable on the left hand side. And there's the formula that we uh, had before, total variation minus unexplained variation, which is explained variation, right, divided by total variation. Now, here's the issue, of course, I talked about this in the last chapter, it's tempting to say, okay, if we want to explain something, then let's just throw a bunch of extra independent variables in there, we're bound, we're bound to improve the model's explanatory power. And that, of course, is true, the R square will increase if you add independent variables to the multiple regression model. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting any better. It doesn't mean that we're improving the goodness of fit. And so the adjusted R square um, reduces the impact of those extra variables by considering, considering the degrees of freedom. And that takes us through chapter nine. Next up is modeling and forecasting.